Hello and welcome to the ArtsLink Assembly. This year we are entirely online and this is week four of our five-week assembly with a focus on radical hospitality. The ArtsLink Assembly brings together artists and thinkers to reflect on the artist's role and their practice in building and sustaining civil society. This week in election week, and I hope you're all sustaining the tension at the moment, but we wanted to talk about something perhaps utopian to some, but already a lived reality for many who are finding ways to connect and share trans globally and trans uh, nationally. We wanted to look at the whole idea of no borders and post-nationalism. And we invited uh, the professor of philosophy at uh, University of Denver, Thomas Nail, to curate a series of resources, readings, um, and, and artworks that you can see on our resources page, but to pull together a, a week of conversations and a panel, which tomorrow you can see Thomas moderating with Alex Sega and Nandita Sharma. Today, however, uh, sadly, Tanya Bruguera, who was to uh, conduct this conversation with Nandita, was really prevented from doing so by what is ironically enough, uh, governmental borders, or in this case, cyber borders, restrictions on the internet uh, that she could access from her home base in Havana in Cuba. So we are very fortunate indeed that Thomas was both free at this moment and able to step in. We only made this transition yesterday, so we're incredibly grateful for Thomas for joining us a day earlier than planned, but in conversation with uh, Nandita Sharma, Professor of Sociology at the University of Hawaii. Thomas, I hope you're there. Okay, Simon, are you are you there? Did you, you disappeared? <laughs> um, I disappeared. Okay. I, I leave it to you. I'll <laughs> jump jump in at the end. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, big big thanks to Simon for organizing this event and um, to all the art the Arts Link Assembly people who have helped organize the conference. Um, it's really important, and it's such a great thing that we're able to talk about no bor no borders. Um, there was definitely a time that this movement was much smaller and I feel like it's gaining traction. So I'm uh, very thankful to, to be able to have this conversation this week. Um, and I'm very thankful that uh, Nandita was willing to, uh, to talk with us today um, and uh, talk a little bit about her book and about things in general, No Borders. Um, so first of all, thank you, Nandita, and congratulations on the publication of your book, uh, Home Rule national sovereignty and the separation of natives and migrants uh, with Duke University Press. Um, this is a, such an incredible book. Um, and I feel like I've, I've, I've very much learned a lot. If there is such a thing as an academic page turner, uh, that's, that's what I feel about this book when I was reading it. Um, it synthesizes an enormous amount of literature very rapidly. Um, and so uh, I'm, I, I have a number of, of questions that I think will, uh, I'm, be very broad, but hopefully you can respond to them in 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 and and in, in relationship to the book. Uh, but one very very broad question that you talk about in the beginning of the book uh, that I wanted to ask you: There's that we're living in this very weird paradoxical moment where the nation state as a structure has never been more violent, more more destructive, more unequal economically speaking. The richest one percent of people uh, globally now possess more wealth than the rest of the world. 
um, the, that nation states have never felt as, as inadequate as they do today of solving problems of global migration, of climate change. Um, and yet at the same time, as we're encountering all of these limits, the, the, the unraveling of so many things that the nation state promised us, uh, equality, universality, um, global community, at the moment that all those are unraveling, we're seeing a doubling down, an absolute commitment to increased borders, rigidification, uh, anti-immigration, xenophobia, racism. Um, I, my, my question here is, why, wh why is this paradox happening to us? And more dramatically, you know, why are we being trumped to death? Like, why, why, why is, why is, why at the moment would this the least thing that we need? We are, we're getting the Trumps and the Bolsonaros. Yeah, and um, I think you're absolutely right. And before I answer um, that really uh, important and interesting question, I also want to thank you, Thomas, for stepping in at the last moment uh, and facilitating this conversation. It's, I really appreciate it. And I, and you know, I love your work, so it's a great pleasure to also um, have a conversation with you about, about No Borders. Um, and thank you to Simon, especially for all of the patience and organizing and everyone and, you know, everyone else whose labor is absolutely essential to making this possible. So I think in terms of answering your question, and it is a really important paradox to really uh, uh, question. I think many people who think about it, think of it as a contradiction and it's not at all a contradiction. So I'm glad that you framed it as a paradox rather than a contradiction. You know, for so many years, we've been hearing people saying, oh, why is capital so mobile when people are not as, you know, allowed to be as mobile? And it's like, that's not a contradiction. That is the structure <laughs> of the system that we live in that is meant to be that way. Um, and I think that, you know, what we're living in is a system, a global system of nation states that corresponds in no way to the reality of how people live their lives. You know, I think that should be the starting point, um, because if that's our starting point, then we understand we need to build a different system, that this system is designed precisely to produce the Trumps and the Bolsonaros and the Modis and the Dutertes and you know, the rest of the authoritarian gang that is spreading like wildfire across uh, the globe right now. Um, so I think the paradox is the very structure of the nation state, the nation state by definition, in contrast to earlier forms of state power, uh, which were, you know, destructive and violent in their own ways, the particular violence of the nation states is about continuously defining who belongs, who doesn't belong, who has rights, who doesn't have rights, you know, so one of the main rights that um, come with getting national self-determination, national sovereignty, is the right to determine your membership, right? Every, st every nation state is given the power and the authority, the legitimacy to say, well, you can be a member and you can't be a member and it's up to us to decide. And there's been, you know, a, as migration scholars have pointed out, a constant culling. There's been a constant culling of who belongs, who doesn't belong. And because that never corresponds with who actually lives in the territory of a nation state, like every single nation state in the world has people that are either legally defined or socially defined as not belonging, the violence is built into the system, right? And what we're seeing and what my book tries to um, uh, document and analyze and address is that the criteria for national belonging is narrowing, right? Nationalism is hardening and it's narrowing. And, it, and I really like the way that you put it, that people are doubling down precisely when it becomes more and more evident that this system is not designed to meet our actual lived conditions. And I think people double down because the one thing that we have been told about this system is that the problems in whatever problems we may have, they're always caused by foreigners, right? They're caused by foreigners who are competing with us for our jobs. They're caused by foreign capital who is competing for our capital. 
um, for our factory sites, for our production, um, for our taxes, you know, on and on and on. So it's the system is built in to produce a scapegoat, right? Uh, and to continuously produce the nation as the solution for all of the problems. So I think that's why nationalism produces more nationalism. You know, it's always the idea that the problem is that is not national sovereignty. It's always, we don't have enough sovereignty. We need more sovereignty. We need more things to be sovereign about. We need more control over how people move, who's allowed to um, have rights, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, do you think part of that has to do with with fear, um, you know, the rise of authoritarian leaders is they stoke this fear and there is genuine reason. There are good reasons to be afraid right now. I mean, climate change is a, is a, is a scary thing that affects a lot of people. And people see that in the, in the coming future, that the world, that that problem is not going to go away so easily um, and economic inequality so much. I mean, more than half of the United States is at or below poverty level. Like poverty is a very real feeling of fear and insecurity. And you're right. It's a built-in scapegoat. That's like, here's the problem, immigrants. And that, I mean, Trump essentially had no platform except that they're murderers, they're rapists, they're coming for our everything. And this is the only way to protect it is to, to invoke me and the nation state and double down on borders. Uh, when that is precisely the problems of, of that have produced the migration in the first place is U.S. imperialism, the history of U.S. colonialism and capitalism and all of those things. That's what Trump stood for was, yes, more of that to produce more immigration, to produce more fear, to produce more authoritarian personalities. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other part of the agenda um, that also feeds into the xenophobia, the, the idea that the nation state is the solution rather than the problem is this constant focus. You know, I don't know if I can do a good Trump impersonation, but <laughs> China, right? It's just this constant focus on what we need is an authoritarian leader who will bring back our jobs, right? That is the other part. That's the flip side of the anti-immigration part is anti-foreign anti, anti -foreign, foreign workers in other places, right? The anti, you know, so I think the other part of the nation state system that my book is trying to illuminate is the fact that you know, after World War II, when the system of nation states became truly hegemonic, right, and became, you know, nation, nation uh, national self-determination, national sovereignty became the only legitimate form that state power could take. You know, when we, when the world entered World War II, you know, we were still living in a world of very, very powerful and very large imperial states, right? You know, the two, two of the biggest powers going into World War II was the British Empire and the French Empire, right? Coming out of World War II, we see the dissolution of empires shortly thereafter, and we start seeing the global ascendancy and, and ultimately by the 1960s, the empires are gone. Even the metropoles of the empires are now nation states with their own immigration laws, right? Like the the first kind of significant immigration law um, of the British Empire was 1962, right? Uh, in terms of keeping out the previous right. subjects of its right. empires, right? And we we tend to think of immigration laws as timeless and just as a part of all state sovereignty, and that's absolutely incorrect. Um, but what we saw after World War II with the global rise of nation states as the only legitimate form of state power, and, and we all continue to think, you know, many of us continue to think it's perfectly legitimate, is the global expansion of capitalism. Capitalism expanded after World War II, and it expanded not through imperialism, but through nation states, right? Each and every single nation state facilitated the expansion of capitalism within its territories and facilitated the mobility of capital across the, across the entire you know, international system. Um, so I think one of the things that authoritarians tell us today 
after the last, you know, um, 40, 50 years of neoliberalism, right, uh, is that they will protect us from the globalization of capital instead of actually, so we're not able to see that capitalism globalized further through the nation states. We actually think it globalized against the power of nation states. And so authoritarians step in and say, if you are, if you are experiencing hardship because of the, global, the further globalization of capital, the nation state is what you have to turn to. But of course, that's not going to work, right? Like Trump, Modi, Bolsonaro, Duterte, they are all neoliberal um, mm -hmm. rulers. They want the further facilitation of capital mobility, but the promises that have all failed to be delivered upon is that somehow we can return uh, to a period um, where manufacturing happened in high wage, you know, when we're talking about the United States, relatively high waged um, parts of the global system. That's, you know, so I think it's also the failure of analysts of this period to connect the global expansion of capital with the expansion of the nation state system, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, that's extremely well said. And that the, the first chapter of your book, I think, covers an incredible amount of ground very rapidly, everything you're saying in a, in a more expanded way. But it's, that's the story that I think people are not. Uh, yeah, that's the analysis we're missing is the, the long story and what seems like a contradiction. It's, it's, it, it, it's only the system playing out. It is the combination of nation states and capitalism playing out. Um, so speaking of which and of, of this related theme and the, the, the sort of next step in this history of the rise of nation states too, one thing that I found really helpful in your book was kind of uh, untying a, 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 a few naughty, naughty words that for me uh, that were sort of knotted together in very sticky, I suppose, words um, that we find a lot in the discourse about uh, migration and borders and nationalism. Um, and I was wondering if you could, for us, just kind of define and compare and contrast these 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 four terms uh, that for me I think are very challenging and I think your, your book helped clarify for me what those words mean how they've been used maybe a different way in which we ought to think about them um, and, and 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 for the audience to kind of just being introduced to these issues and thinking about that deep history of nation states as being fundamental to where we're at today um, so these four words are post-nationalism uh, post-colonialism, neo-colonialism, and decolonization. Um, right. If you could, if you could, if you could just say a bit about sort of untangling those words, um, I, I found it immensely helpful. So post-nationalism, decolonization, post-colonialism, and neo-colonialism. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I think actually I would love to hear your thoughts on post-nationalism. Uh, I, I don't actually uh, talk too much about that in the book. Um, uh, and I, I do not think we are living in a post-nationalist period. If, if what we mean by post-nationalism is what we mean by post-colonialism, I think post-colonialism in many people's mind has been incorrectly um, conflated with decolonization. Right. So you have either people who who think that national sovereignty resulted in decolonization, which I would argue it did nothing um, to that effect. Right. To have national sovereignty does not mean that you are you are living in a decolonized uh, society or a decolonized planet. I would say that national sovereignty is a form of governmentality or a form of ruling. Um, that looks very different that, than the kinds of ruling practices associated with imperial states, at least politically associated with imperial states, but it is still a form of ruling. And that is quite evident when we look at the demands of anti-colonial movements, right? Anti-colonial movements had some pretty common and very specific demands, right? We want the land back. Right? We want our labor to stop being exploited. We want dignity and we want the ability to have control over our lives. None of that was achieved. None of that was achieved. No nation state in the world, you know, no national sovereign that replaced the imperial sovereign provided that. 
right? Um, so I would say the first delinking that has to happen is post-colonialism is not decolonization. And people who are critical of post-colonialism will say that, right? Like, oh, we're not in a post-colonial society because some of us still believe that we are colonized, right? Because because we don't have our own national sovereignty, right? So there are still people in the world today who very much associate national sovereignty with decolonization. So in many in many efforts to decolonize, we, we still see that false linkage, right? That once we become national sovereigns over national territory, we will have achieved decolonization. And uh, you know, I think the main purpose for me writing this book was to delink those two, that national sovereignty doesn't produce decolonization. But what I do think that the, the critique that post-colonialism is inadequate to, to talk about both, you know, for people, for instance, who believe that they are still colonized, um, um, I think that that's also a, a problematic Thing. So what I try to do in the book is to show that post-colonialism is actually a form of ruling relationships. And the form of ruling relationships that I call the post-colonial new world order is the world order of nation states and how capital uses nation states to expand right, to expand um, the, you know, what gets put into the market, more and more things are in the marketplace than they were, at, you know, prior to World War II, more and more people's labor is in the capitalist marketplace than it was after World War II, and nation states were absolutely central to facilitating those processes, mm -hmm. turning, for example, subsistence farmers into the proletariat, right? That is something that we've seen in every single nation state in the world, whether they were nominally socialist or communist or nominally capitalist, they all did the same thing. They turned people from subsistence, um, you know, people who largely relied on subsistence um, and their own means of subsistence into the proletariat. So there's hardly any people or any place in the world that is not, not totally enmeshed within capitalist social relationships right now. So to me, post-colonialism is that form of governance, that governance through the nation state. So that's how I define post-colonialism. But drawing upon, for instance, Frederick Cooper's definition of post-colonialism, which is the delegitimization of imperial states. So, you know, Frederick Cooper talks about the post-colonial period is when imperialism became no longer legitimate, right? Empires were no longer legitimate. They're you know, having colonies was no longer legitimate. National sovereignty was the only thing that became legitimate. Um, and so that legitimation process is what we are dealing with when you talked about earlier about the paradox, that we actually feel free while we are being ruled over, right? That's the right. paradox of nationalism. Um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, just the neocolonialism thing, which drives me yeah. insane, which is this idea. So neocolonialism was a theory that was developed in the you know, late 1950s, early 1960s. And it's definitely associated with third, third world political theorists and politicians and state leaders, particularly Nkrumah, uh, in Ghana, in the, you know, in the national liberation state of Ghana, to try and make sense of why national sovereignty didn't feel much different than imperialism, right? So why did all these third world national sovereign, you know, nationally sovereign states still feel like they were being ruled over, being controlled by these forces that were outside of their nationalized societies, right? So this theory was developed that the reason that national liberation was unable to deliver on its promises was because of international forces still led by the most powerful states. And of course, after World War II, the most powerful state is the United States. And that's not a coincidence um, by any means. Um, and you know the the Bretton Woods institutions that were put into place after World War II, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, um, the Global Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, which became the WTO in the 1990s, um, 
and of course, just um, the financial system that was put, you know, that, that all of those institutions were a part of, they did control what happened around the world, right? They did control the flow of finances. They did control whether any nation state in the world um, received funds for quote unquote development. Um, you know, and of course the US military as well as the Soviet Union during the Cold War did interfere militarily around the world, right? So national sovereignty never, never felt like what people thought it would feel like. But instead of saying, oh, okay, this system that we maybe some of us actually believed would solve the problems of colonization, it's not working. They, they, they did double down. So the theory of neocolonialism doubles down on the idea that what is missing, especially in the third world, is more national sovereignty, right? And it also deflected attention away, you know, you know, focusing all of the attention on the United States or the Soviet Union, or focusing all the attention on the IMF, the World Bank, et cetera, also deflected attention from the very real policy decisions and very real commitment of third world national leaders to the expansion of capitalist social relationships inside their territorial borders, right? So mm -hmm. I was born in India. Both of my grandparents were very active in the anti-colonial movement against the British empire there. Um, and what we see in India right after uh, independence in 1947 is we need new mega development projects. We need new dams. We need the electrical grid. We need industrial agriculture. We need um, you know, mass irrigation and monocropping of cash crops. All of that displaced tens and hundreds of millions of people and brought them into capitalist social relationships. And yet we were told that the problem was the United States, the problem was the IMF, the problem was the World Bank, which of course they were the problem, but so were the national leaders of India and every other single nation state in the world. So neocolonialism to me operated as an alibi to especially third world leaders uh, to deflect attention from their own responsibility in building the post-colonial new world order. I think that's such a such a great critique. I, I just I just I love that and could not agree more. And I'll throw one more example on just from my own research. In the case of Mexico, that's exactly what happened. Um, we could go back to once Mexico established independence, it stole the land from the indigenous uh, Hito farmers uh, and the people that had been farming that land. And then once NAFTA went into effect. They blamed the U.S. They blamed the loans, uh, and they blame and 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 they did exactly what you said to build more dams, more uh, more uh, industrial agriculture. So they appropriated, they changed their independent constitution, which originally had some space for for indigenous subsistence farming, and then they changed the constitution, stole all that land, and that's exactly. I mean, that is that is one of the big reasons for so much immigration uh, out of Mexico to the United States. It's precisely that history in which Mexico in that neo-colonial narrative, oh, it wasn't the nation state, it's not the project of independence. So in one, with one hand, they're sort of blaming, you know, the, the, the empires, with the other hand, they're blaming the indigenous peasants for not, you know, stepping it up and, you know, come on and getting on board with the project of nationalization. Um, and, but I think that's, that's, I think that's such a good description of, of how to think about that problem. And that, and that shows you that the nation state uh, even the post-colonial nation state is really at odds uh, uh, with the with the with the decolonization, the project of decolonization. Yeah, they, um, I mean, it's at odds with the demands of anti-colonialism. Like the demands have not been met, but we don't feel like we need, like for an instance, in India, to argue that we need anti-colonialism doesn't make any more sense to us, right? Because people mm -hmm. in India don't feel colonized, right? They just feel they don't have enough national sovereignty. And so we need we need more and more authoritarian leaders who will promise us more sovereignty, right? And and be kind of belligerent in a global in a global arena, right? Uh, right. So this this so now that we're talking about uh, um, 
indigenous and native claims. I did, that's another big feature of the book that I thought was very important was uh, your description and your definition and analysis of the history of that term native um, and how it's appropriated by different groups of people. Um, and so that, that's, that's, you know, in Colorado, you know, I, I drive around and I see people with these bumper stickers that say native, and it always creeps me the hell out that they've put these bumper stickers on their car. I mean, they're in, I've seen them in other states too, but this claim that even people, you know, they want to claim to be native, which is, it's offensive on many levels. Um, and, but what they're trying, they're both at the same time distinguishing themselves as as, as the real natives, uh, not the indigenous people who have that or, original claim. Um, and also that they're native, meaning they're not immigrants. I mean, putting that sticker, it looks like it's just pride for your state or wherever, but it's actually quite offensive to, to, to both indigenous people and to immigrants as well, who you're basically just saying, I'm, you're an immigrant. That's what that means. That sticker means I'm from here, you're not. Like yeah. I have more authority over this territory than you do. Um, and also simultaneously reclaiming that from indigenous people. Anyway, your, your analysis is much more robust, but it made me think of that moment where we've seen a resurgence of nativism in the United States. Um, but anyway, so what's, what is the problem with, it, with nativism? Who's claimed it and why is it at the core of our contemporary moment? Well, you know, the category of native is, is initially a, well, actually it's, um, it, it, you can go back and associate the category of native with actually being a slave, right? So the kind of earliest, you know, definitions in, in, in the English language about what native means uh, links it back to a labor relationship, right? Like someone whose labor is being exploited uh, in a more kind of feudal system but the kind of contemporary meaning of native actually is initially a, an imperial state category. To be native meant that you were a colonized subject of an empire, right? You were the natives of India. You were the natives of um, Mexico. You were the natives of, you know, the British colony of Canada, you know, whatever, right? Uh, so it was an imperial state category that was juxtaposed and set in opposition to European. So the category of European and the category of native acted as kind of a negative duality with all good things being European, um, all things powerful being European, all things um, negative and subordinated being native. But with the post-colonial new world order that was kind of flipped on its head, so to, because, because of the imperial association of native with both being colonized, but also being of that territory, of that, col of that colonial administrative unit, right? Um, and throughout the 19th century, the imperial state hardened that definition of native, of being kind of a territorialized identity. Um, by bifurcating the colonized native, right? So they had the imperial category, you are the natives of X colony. They started bifurcating that in the middle of the 19th century in a classic divide and conquer strategy. Like how do we divide the natives so that you know, they are less threatening to the continued existence of the empire? So they bifurcated the category into, and, and Mahmoud Mamdani has done really excellent work on this, into this category of indigenous native. So this is where this kind of construct of indigeneity gets brought into it. And it's a very territorialized, essentialist idea that the indigenous natives are the real people of this place, right? Um, and then the other natives were the quote unquote, literally the migrant natives. So they're still colonized, so they're still native, but they are from somewhere else other than this specific colony. And then rights and um, I, you know, ideas of tradition and custom became more and more located in indigeneity, right? Now, once, the, once um, empires dissolve and nation states take their place, those categories kind of morphed, right? Like there used to be a period until World War, you know, until actually the post-World War II era where it was thought in, in European um, uh, political thought that the natives were incapable of self-governance, right? 
you know, we see that embedded in the League of Nations, right? That, you know, even though they're using the term nations, the, um, the empires are self-determinant and then the colonies still need tutelage, right? Um, and after World War II, um, as anti-colonial movements fought for national sovereignty, got the national sovereignty, empires are dissolving, they're becoming nation states too, that kind of flipped. So the territorial idea still was embedded in the nation state system, right? This is national territory. The idea of self-governance was still attached to ideas of nationhood, right? So we get this kind of national self-determination. And in order to qualify for national self-determination, you had to prove that you were a nation, right? How, do, how best to prove that you are a nation that should be sovereign over a particular territory than to claim ancestral, timeless, um, essentialized territorial belonging to that particular territory, right? So native kind of got flipped on its head. So it used to be this category that was completely undeserving of nationhood. And now nationhood increasingly depended on being a native person of that place. And so the competition started, who is the real natives of this place? And in some places, you know, you, you know, like in France, you know, Marine Le Pen, when she was, you know, running for power and got, you know, a third of the vote in France, the last in the last presidential election, you know, the discourse was the first French, we are the first French. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we are the natives of France and that discourse of indigeneity and of nativeness is a part of every far right movement in Europe right now. Actually, of every far right movement on the planet mm -hmm. right now is mm -hmm. that idea of indigeneity and we are the native people of this place and kind of like your Coloradans, right, who believe that they're native and therefore the native status gives them the authority over the place and over migrants, right, everyone else who's not a native. Um, that's exactly the, that's what the nation state system is built on. And that's precisely, you know, going back to your earliest question, that is why we're seeing the rise of authoritarianism, right? is the further narrowing of who belongs to the nation, right? It is no longer sufficient to be a national citizen. Ask Marine Le Pen if the citizens, if all citizens in France are equal. No, they are not. Some of us are real French people mm -hmm. and others of us are, yeah, you may be a citizen, but what is that? that like, that's just a legal device and it's kind of, it's kind of suspect and it's illegitimate. How did you become a citizen in our national homeland? That's exactly what this idea of native um, attached to nationalism is producing, right? Now, of course, and, and sorry, I, I know I'm rambling on here, but just to get to someplace like the United States or Canada or Australia or New Zealand, where you also have indigenous people who are also mobilizing the discourse of indigeneity, of nativeness, of national sovereignty. Clearly, they're not part of the far right, right? <laughs> clearly, clearly, we should not equate them with you know, the far right in Europe or the far right in the United States. But at the same time, many of the kind of philosophical bases for precisely those kinds of very hardened nationalist um, politics are embedded within any use of the category of native or indigeneity, right? Because the category itself has a built-in philosophical project or political project, I mean, which is that if you are native to this territory, you do get to have the first say and the last say of what happens there. And that say is over and against everyone who is not native. And we can see this. So in the book I discuss in the, in the US context, two, uh, in the US and Canada context, two um, indigenous groups of people who in their struggle against colonialism for national sovereignty are utilizing the same practices of culling right, of saying 
who are the real members of the Mohawks? Who are the real members of the Cherokee Nation? Right? And, and I'm not equating that with, you know, you know, the genocide in Rwanda, which also operated along these same philosophical lines of, you know, the, the Hutus being native and the Tutsis being migrants. But it, there is a culling going on here, right? More and more people are being um, ejected from the membership of the Mohawks or of the Cherokee along the same lines, right? You're not able to, pr you're not able to pr um, um, prove ancestral genealogical ties to this nation. You're not able to prove, you know, no one has adopted you into the nation, so you're just out, right? And I think that those logics are dangerous and they, again, are not going to produce decolonization. So why are we, you, you know, why are we using them? Why are we supporting them? Thanks. That that history makes it, it explains so much, and I've often wondered about that. And I, I think that that's a very compelling, a very compelling history that 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, I just wanted to to remind uh, the audience that if you have any questions, you can type those into the chat, um, and we'll uh, we'll we'll leave some time. I have maybe only one or two more, and then I'll pause, and and we can answer questions from the audience. If you if you just want to type them into the chat, we'll we'll come to them. Um, Yes, so much to say on that, but I, I want to ask you another another question um, because I, well maybe maybe just one thing, which is that's to me I think what's sort of interesting about the figure of the migrant and and two I think we maybe share this agreement about the importance of that figure because the migrant is sort of something it's an open it's a much more open category than either the the natives on either side no matter who's claiming that term the migrants get excluded. Um, and that population of migrants gets larger and larger, the more claimants there are to nativism, the more refined and restricted those get. And then that, that margin of people that started out possibly s somewhat small, apparently as an exception, no longer is the exception. It's just the rule that more and more people are expelled based on uh, someone else's claim to, 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 be, uh, to be the genuine owners uh, and proprietors of, of some piece of territory. So I, yeah, I think, I think that, that, that the migrant gets left out of every one of those stories. And for that reason is, yeah, quite interesting. Um, but I, but I did have a question about, um, uh, uh, so you and I both come to political theory from, from uh, activism, from, from doing activist work. And that informs quite a bit of, of, of what we do. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that issue. I mean, there are many uh, also uh, activists and, and, and artists too that are, that are listening to, to our conversation. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important conversation worth having when we can have it uh, in, in an open way is what's the relationship of academics to activists um, or artists working with activists or around political movements. Um, some activists very much feel that they um, they that that they don't want interlopers, artists who are just there to use their movement for something else, for an art project, or academics who are there to study whatever it is about their work. They're like, we don't want to be studied. Just let us do our thing and stop leeching off of our of our project. Um, if you're not if you're not going to to help us. So I guess my question to you would be, um, you know, what how can we as academics and 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 artists be good? good allies with activists uh, in a way that doesn't try to speak for them or, uh, you know, stand out in front and tell them what to do. Um, that kind of old classical vanguard vision of the intellectuals knowing what to do and the masses not knowing and that that's an extremely problematic thing. So what, what has been your experience and relationship and what do you think a, a positive one would be like how should artists and academics approach uh, activist movements. Well, I mean, I think the, the starting point is to take activism as a serious site of theoretical knowledge, right? Theoretical development. They, you know, we are all engaging in theory, right? We're all coming up with explanations of why the world is messed up, what we need to do to change it, et cetera. So it's to take, it's to take seriously the fact that activists are engaged in defining what the problem is and in defining how to solve the problem and to engage at that level. Like I, for example, do think um, that some of the ways that we theorize what the problem is, foreigners, 
or the way that, you know, because the left has been as important in producing the figure of the migrant um, and foreigners as has the right, right? Because so much of the left is nationalist. Um, um, so I do think that the way that, you know, speaking for myself, the way that I participate in activism is by um, helping to define what the problem is and helping to define what the solution is and not thinking of myself as, you know, necessarily telling people what to think, but saying, hey, you know, here are some ideas, here are some thoughts, here are some um, problems with the way that we've done activism in the past, on um, the way we're currently doing activism, we're, we may actually be contributing to the problem itself. Let's rethink this. So rethinking to me is as important as um, uh, anything else. So like, let me just give you an example very briefly in the, and you know, I've been, I was an activist long before I was ever an academic. So to me, the two are indistinguishable. Like, I don't know how to distinguish the two. To me, an activist is someone who's trying to change the world in order to produce a just and livable um, and beautiful world, right? Um, and academics can contribute to that. Artists can contribute to that. Um, but for example, in the summer of 1999, while I was living in Vancouver and finishing my PhD, four boats arrived on the west coast of Canada, of British Columbia, um, from China, right? They were private vessels that um, had been hired by people trying to move from China into North America, right, in search of a better livelihoods. Um, the, the media and the Canadian government went into racist hysterics with the arrival of about 599 people, right? 599 people from China just sent them into a conniption fit, right? Of like, we're being invaded, we've lost control of our borders, these people are um, economic refugees, they're not real refugees, so on and so forth. And, and we immediately, a group of us started a feminist organization to work with the women and the children who were on those boats. And some of the women in the organization I was a part of started talking about these women as victims of trafficking, right? And we need to end trafficking. We need to protect these women from the people who actually helped them move here, by the way, right? Like the people who were on those boats, hired the boats, got the boats, steered the boat over here. They are actually the traffickers and we need to protect these women and children from them. And, you know, I'd never heard of trafficking in 1999. I was like, okay, you know, I don't know what's going on here. But what was interesting to me was that the Minister of Immigration of Canada at that time jumped on the anti-immigrant, I mean, anti-trafficking bandwagon and said, yes, these women and children are victims of trafficking and the men that were on those ships, oh, they're not refugees, they're traffickers. So let's put them all in jail. The men go to jail because they're traffickers. The women go to jail because they are being protected from the traffickers. We can't keep them on the street. The traffickers will get them, you know, on and on and on it went. And it was just like, okay, this is going crazy. Um, and then the women who were interested in calling um, the refugee women um, victims of trafficking were like, let's find them jobs in the garment industry in Vancouver um, in sweatshop conditions and wages to protect them from the sex traffickers that want to lure them into prostitution. And it was just like, okay, everything is gone insane. What is going on here? Why are we facilitating these dialogues and discourses which is when, as an academic, I delved into the laws and policies of anti-trafficking and said, look, people, this is a problem. If we say that the traffickers are the problems that these women are experiencing, we've just a delegitimized the very people who help them move. We've criminalized the people who've helped them move. And we have allowed the Canadian government off scot-free their immigration policies, their border controls, their their pathetic asylum seek, you know, asylum policies, all of that gets off scot-free and the problem is the traffickers. 
So to me, that is a classic way that as an activist and an academic, I am contributing to the movement by saying, let's not fall into this trap. Let's not call migrants victims of trafficking. They are not, right? They are victims of nation state policies that prevent their freedom of movement, which is how I became a no borders activist, actually. <laughs> That's how the critique of anti-trafficking is how I became a no borders activist. So it was like, okay, this is not working. We need a new right. system. We need a system without constraints on people's freedom of mobility. That's the struggle. It's not a struggle against traffickers. It's not a struggle for fairer asylum policies because those policies are designed to fail, right? It's actually a no borders world. And so, you know, here we are. <laughs> Great, that's actually a perfect segue into um, a question that, that, that uh, Simon's asked, which overlaps with the question that I was gonna ask you. Um, and I'll, I'll just, sorry, I said for, for, for the audience to, if they had questions, put them in the chat. Um, there's actually a separate box that's called Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen you can click on and you can just type your question into that um, if you have questions. So, you know, we're, we're sort of in, in, in toward, toward uh, the end enough of the, of, the, of the conversation. If you wanna add, if you have questions, um, uh, you please put them in there. Uh, but the, so the question that Simon is asking and the, and the question that I have, uh, the, the way that, that Simon put it was what are the conditions uh, do we need to put in place to imagine a post-nationalist world? And somehow I got I got off by, ha I didn't have to define that. You asked me and I think I answered something else. Uh, so I was able to get away from answering that question. Um, uh, but my, my question now that you're talking about uh, no borders is um, just to ask you what you think about, what does that mean for you? What does no borders mean to you? Ver and, and maybe would you want to distinguish it uh, from open borders? Um, or freedom of mobility, um, uh, like where um, there, there are, uh, I mean, another idea too that Etienne Balabar talks about is uh, because he doesn't want to say he's, a, he's against all borders, he's in favor of dem de democratized borders, but he never says exactly what that would look like when he says it. I'm like, well, what, what, what is, how does that work under the conditions of the nation state? And um, in any case, I, I, I think I, I and Simon both sort of, what do you think? What does no borders mean to you? Um, how do you imagine that? Well, I really like the fact that no borders has become an important enough idea and political project that people are now trying to parse it out. Like, how is it different from open borders? How is it different from simply calling for freedom of mobility? So I love the fact that it is expanding. And I would love to hear you talk about post-nationalism. So you may not be talking about that. Um, but to me, all states constrain people's freedom of mobility. All states do. Nation states do it in particular ways through immigration controls. Imperial states did it largely through exit controls. Um, feudal states did that through, you know, um, containing labor on feudal estates, you know, um, um, previous imperial states did it through slavery, right? Um, there's all kinds of ways that states no. So I think a no borders politics is also an anarchist project, right? It is an anti-state politics, right? It is saying that yes, class relationships also must be abolished for there to be freedom and for there to be liberty but so must the state because the state is the institutional basis for class relationships, right? So the state and, the cl and class relationships to me are completely intertwined historically. Both of them are interested in constraining the freedom of mobility of the people who they rely on to um, create their, you know, their positions of wealth and power. Right, so to me, a no borders politics is absolutely revolutionary. It is not a policy prescription for nation states, right? <laughs> it's not a policy, you know, I can't imagine like testifying in the US Congress that there should be no borders, right? It, it, it makes no, and I think that's why it doesn't make sense to people. It makes no sense to people because this system cannot allow for it. So it is a revolutionary call. It truly is. It cannot co coexist 
with any part of the way we organize our world today, whether that's through class relationships, gender relationships, racialized relationships, and certainly citizenship, right? So I don't know what Balibar means when he says that borders can be democratized because to me, democracy means autonomy from rulers, right? <laughs> Whether those are class rulers or state rulers, the two are kind of indistinguishable from one another. Um, so it is a revolution. It's not just, it's not easy. And that's, so that means building a revolutionary movement in which that is a central demand. Which is Thanks, not, that, yeah. which is just to say one last thing, like some of the movements that could, we currently think of as revolutionary, anti-colonial movements struggling for national sovereignty, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a revolutionary movement, right? Because those movements cannot account for freedom of mobility. And without freedom of mobility, you know, I kind of agree with Hannah Arendt, right? That this is a foundational basis for freedom is freedom of mobility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I, I I I agree with that, and I think it connects up sort of with both of our experiences in 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 living in Toronto and working with No One Is Illegal. I mean, they're one of the most radical groups, and that's that's why I was drawn to them. Was they had it wasn't just we're another migrant justice movement. They were that plus they were like, well, true migrant justice means justice for everyone everywhere, and that is a global revolutionary strategy. Um, that is that starts from the position of migrant justice and sees the entanglement of all those things because some some critiques even I mean from from inside the left even will say things like look open borders if nation states just open borders one of the effects will be that you will essentially drain populations from other third world developing countries who don't want to lose those people and the truth is economically even though the argument is not best made from the perspective of economics. E economics, people who study economics, economics professors and advisors, they know full well that immigration always increases GDP. It is a money maker. It increases jobs, it increases wages for uh, resident citizens. Um, it has all these benefits for the nation state. Um, and by opening borders, oh yes, yeah, the economy will flourish, but like at what expense? Um, so opening borders, yeah, I mean, it, the, I think there are some benefits, but without the abolition, I mean, without some real genuine transformation of global inequality, you're just, you're making things maybe a little better, but also worse at the same time, if it's not also an anti-capitalist project. And I think that's right. I think whenever you say no borders, it sounds like it might be a policy prescription at a surface level, but you just scratch the surface and you quickly realize that this is, it doesn't make any sense unless these other things are wrapped up, which sound on the face of them way more radical and way more distant on the horizon, like anarchism, the abolition of capitalism, uh, you know, like, yeah, the global abolition of capitalism in nation states. It sounds so much easier to just say no borders. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that you're right. I, no borders without the abolition of the nation state it would not it would not it would not successfully achieve the aims that no borders actually i think seeks to 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 achieve no because because border controls are ideological right they we know they're not stopping people so what yeah. are they doing what are borders doing today they're not stopping the movement of people more people are moving today than they were when i first started studying borders dramatically more people Three times more people are moving around the world across nation national borders than they were when I started studying borders, which, you know, I may, I'm not that old, right? So it's like <laughs> border controls aren't working to stop people's mobility per se. Like they are killing more and more people all the time, right? Absolutely, they are very harmful. But what the main effect of border controls is, is to produce a uh, you know, uh, uh, a category of people within nation states who can be legally and, leg you know, for many people, legitimately denied the rights and entitlements that are associated with national citizenship. That is one of the main effects of border controls today, mm -hmm. right? So eliminating borders 
um, is about eliminating the ability for us to also be socially, socially and politically, juridically divided from one another through our placement in these different categories, right? So I conclude the book by actually arguing that the category of migrant, along with the category of the national citizen, uh, and the, you know, which is increasingly the native, needs to be eliminated. Those political categories need to be abolished in order for us to no longer be captured and, and contained and constrained by the work that those categories do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, 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 that's a great answer. And I think that definitely points to the future, I mean, maybe some of what Simon is is asking about in the chat, but also um, what that future would look like. It's very, it's it feels very radical, but I agree that 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 it's hard to imagine a different way forward. Um, and just at that moment, I mean, I think it's interesting that the rise of people talking about no borders right now. Um, yeah, please do, uh, folks who are listening uh, and watching, uh, add your Q and A. We we definitely have we have time to 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 hear those. I see there's one added, but I'll just conclude this thought very quickly. Is that it's hard to imagine a different way forward, even if this one seems very difficult and long. The abolition of nation states uh, and 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 the elimination of capital that sounds extreme, but what what alternative is there? And that's I think that's where we're at. Is we're either going to push past the nation state, uh, or we're going to or we're going to double down. And that's exactly what we see: the rise of people talking about no borders uh, and writing about it. I mean, you know, Reese Jones of the collection that both of you and I contributed to. Like that's one of the first. You know, I think there is another one too, but it's one of the first collections of articles. Like academics and intellectuals, political theorists are thinking about borders seriously now. Uh, and and coming to the conclusion that it's you, you're not going to get away from those unless you actually you rethink the entire political theory. It's not just an addendum to existing liberal political theory. It is a deep transformation, and it's taken us a long time to get to this point. But here we are at that cusp, right alongside the rise of right wing xenophobia, climate change, uh, and you know, and Trump. We're all there, you know. Should we go forward? Should we go back? Um, and we're kind of at that turning point. Um, I want to just take a look in, at the at the question here. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read it to you. It says, "Hello, my uh, my question is for Nandita. Thinking of uh, of a post nationalist visual representation of migrants, how do we assess when an image empowers and when it exploits them, or it supports the capitalist system? How can photographs challenge the narrative of a nation state?" Uh I wish my partner was here, uh, Gay Chan. She's a photographer and would have a much better answer about that than I would, because I'm a bit, you know, um, I do feel that photographs, like I'm thinking of Sebastian Salgado's work on uh, migrants. Um, you know, like he's he's done this, you know, what I consider to be a very powerful visual documentation of migrants around the world. But I do also think that when we're talking, like how do you visually represent migrants is also like maybe what we need to do is expand it from, my, from migrants, like not, not continue to create the, you know, to participate in the reproduction of this category of migrant, right? And instead to look at mobility, right? We're all, we're all um, mobile, you know, we're all mobile beings and all of our mobility is actually constrained in different ways, right? Can we, you know, and I'm particularly thinking here of the work of Bridget Anderson, right? Who's done a lot to show us that the separation that we have in our um, politics and in our political structures between citizen and migrant prevents us from seeing that citizens also face mobility controls of a variety of means, right? Through welfare state policies, for example, through labor market policies, through obviously incarceration, you know, so on and so on. So maybe it's about artists helping us to see mobility as central to freedom. I would love to see an artistic project that focuses on mobility and its constraints 
rather than reproducing images of you know the classic figure of the migrant because one of the most offensive photographs that I've seen an artist produced um, recently about migrants was Ai Weiwei's picture of himself lying on a beach and reproducing that horrible uh, image of the two-year-old child from Syria who was murdered by nation state immigration controls, right? Do you remember that picture? That picture of the- Oh two yeah. Um, and I, I do, I'm just shocked that he would do that. I, I don't even remember seeing that, but I feel like that's way over the line. That's, yeah, I think was, that's inappropriate. I, I thought it was extremely inappropriate. The original picture of the two-year-old child was enormously powerful. And it helped to mobilize um, disgust at what nation, national borders were doing, what immigration controls were doing, right? Leading to people having to put themselves onto rickety boats to flee, you know, one of the most violent wars on the planet today, right? The, 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 the you know, the war in Syria. Um, but the but the artistic reproduction of that, especially the one that Ai Weiwei did, was unacceptable. Um, and I don't think I don't I don't know if he understood that. I don't think he ever did understand that. Um, but I would like to see a, a shift away from the kind of classic images of migrant to allowing us to see us as also being constrained in our mobility, whether we fall into that category or not. I don't know what, what. Okay. No, there's a, there's a, there is a, another question. Oh no, just a response, I think. Uh, oh wait, no, I'm sorry. Answered, open. Okay, new questions. Um, yeah, somebody's agreeing about the flagrant uh, um, ness of that, of that, of that. Um, what are the alternatives to capitalist economy that will be able to sustain 7 billion people? So small question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, I would love to help have you also participate in this, Thomas, as well. Um, what do you think? I mean, to me, the only economy that is at all just or and therefore also uh, ecologically viable in terms of reproducing life on this planet is the commons, right? The commons is when we all have um, access to the stuff of life that we need and we access it not because of our status as citizens or mothers or fathers or you know whatever but we access it for simply being a living being right like we access land water air fuel you know all of the things that we need to be alive right um i can't i don't know of another an economic system that could be just or ecologically sustainable. And we would have to, it obviously would have to be planetary. You can't have little islands of commons, right? Surrounded by seas of capitalism, You, it would have to be a global system. Yeah, I, that's, 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 I mean, I agree with that. And I think that um, th there's two questions. One of them is quite long, which is how do we get there from here? Uh, and that might include a lot of intermediate steps, which would sound more reasonable, but would only be intermediate steps. And then there's a the question of where where we would want to go. And I agree with Nandita's answer. That's where we would want to go is a collectively managed commons. And it's not like that's ridiculous. Like most of human history has worked that way. The thing that is actually really shocking is that it's impossible now for us to imagine that. Like that is a very historical moment of amnesia where we can't possibly imagine what it would be like in that world. But for, I'm not saying human history is perfect or by any means, but that it is mostly not capitalist. Um, so it's very easy to imagine other forms because you just have to look past uh, the 16th century and look before that, or look at indigenous populations. And you can see that there are lots of people working in uh, 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 smaller sized economies that that either don't or they peripherally participate in the capitalist system um, at, or going back far enough historically that just have no connection to it um, whatsoever. Um, and I, I, I can't, I, I don't, I don't want to dream up a utopia at this moment, but I'll just give one example historically for me, even though there are many, which is what the Zapatistas are trying to do in Chiapas, Mexico, 
Um, they have a, an economy. It is not outside of the capitalist system. It is not outside of the state. They're just living under post-colonial world system uh, in Mexico and constantly being harassed by paramilitary forces. Um, and, but they are also, they collectively manage the things that they have together based on who needs them. And that, I mean, it would be relative, even one could imagine a trend. So there, it's called cooperative economics, shared ownership. I mean, you know what a, a co-op is, like a co-op is something that's, that's owned collectively by everyone and the products of it are shared by all the people who own it. So they raise, you know, bees and, and, and make honey and make coffee and some of the coffee they use and some of it they sell on, you know, the capitalist market in order to subsidize autonomous education. In any case, it, there are lots of examples of people trying this. I'm not saying they're utopian, but that it, it's not hard for me to imagine what that would be like. Um, and as an intermediate stage, it's not ridiculous to imagine uh, a shift in which everything that was currently private at least shifted over to a model of uh, cooperative. All of the people who currently own so many of the businesses and things that exist, you just, you just, you know, you just chop off the head, the CEO, make sure there's no profits. Everything is reinvested. All of the people who currently work there just get to collectively manage their own labor. It's just democracy. And it sounds, usually democracy sounds good to us, uh, unless it's about economics. And then we're like, oh, that's crazy. How could you possibly have a democratic economy? That does it, that's like a contradiction, but it's only a contradiction for capitalism. And otherwise it's, it's mostly what we all would like to have and practice or try to practice anyway, wherever we're at is shared decision-making over the things that we have access to. Um, you just have to ensure that there's no, there's no profit and there's no accumulation. Uh, and then you'd have some um, intermediate stages anyway. That it, with this, we could we could go on speculating, but um, it yeah. is a good question. It's an open question and one for everybody to decide on. And and how to go how the how to get there from here is is it has to be an open question. And we can't even pretend to answer it unless everybody's involved in that. And that returns us back to the question uh, that we've been talking about, which is no borders. Uh, if people are not involved in making the decisions that affect their own lives, then start again, bring those people in. Everybody needs to be participating and have the right to participate in deciding those things. It's not up to wealthy countries to decide what that future looks like, whether they have an idea of utopia or not. I don't care unless everybody's involved in making that world. It's not a world that I want. Yeah, agreed. Um, and, you know, it is, you know, we have been taught to we, we've been inculcated with the belief that the problem is always scarcity, right? That we always have to address the problem of scarcity and we are never um, allowed to believe that the problem is hoarding, right? That there is plenty in the world for everyone. Um, the problem is that some people are hoarding what everyone else needs, right? The problem is not scarcity. There is no scarcity in this world right? The planet can actually, is more than capable ecologically of actually sustaining more life than currently exists on it. Um, but the, you know, not, not in the conditions of today. Okay. I think we have time. Um, I agree completely with, with what Nandita said. Uh, I think we have time for uh, one last question, um, which is similar to a question I had. So thank you uh, for, for asking it here. Um, so the question is how to further strengthen current transnational struggles for freedom of mobility and liberation movements, your views, uh, and thank you, grateful for this conversation. Um, and I, 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 would, I, would, I would add on to that question, uh, Nandita, of, the, of how to strengthen transnational struggles. It seems like there could be uh, a genuine alliance between in, in, uh, indigenous movements that also are in, in some ways uh, reject the, 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 the colonialism of nation states um, and migrants themselves who have, have, you know, could themselves have an interest. Again, not that they always reject the nation state. Some of them very much want to just be part of that and identify with it. But there's a potential, it seems to me, in indigenous movements and migrant justice movements to form some kind of alliance um, but what other kinds of alliance, you know, do, do, you, do you imagine that would help move this forward? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that those alliance, like all, all um, 
I, I'm kind of reminded actually about um, something that uh, Ruthie Gilmore always reminds us, right? Is that the term allies is a military term and we should expunge it from our mm. political imagination. We are not allies with one another. We are, we need each other for our collective survival, right? And so how do we, to me, the basis is always politics and not categories of identification, right? It's the basis is the politics. Like who in the world right now wants to engage in the struggle against um, constraints on mobility? How can we expand that from the migrant justice projects? How can we expand it so that all of us who are whose you know mobility is constrained fight against constri uh, against that like make the no borders project even bigger right because i really like the way that you put it earlier thomas that the no borders thing started and continues to be very much housed in the migrant justice movements but it is a movement that is important for everyone to participate in but not as allies, not as someone who is doing it because they want to help migrants, but because we are actually all in this together. And mm -hmm. it, you know, we need to all have constraints on our mobility removed in order to be free, right? Which would require the end of class ruling relationships um, and the state, right? So how, and then how do we build mutuality with one another outside of marketplaces um, um, is, is the big thing. But I always fail. I always get a big F for thinking about the future because <laughs> it's hard for me to do that outside of a, of a collective, right? Like, so I, I guess I'm mostly inspired. I can talk about the things that inspire me um, I love the, I love the, I love the ships um, that are being sailed in the Mediterranean and the Aegean right now, um, picking up people that nation states in Europe are, are abandoning, purposely abandoning to die. You know, I really appreciate those projects. And um, if we could connect them somehow to how People in Italy, people in France, people in Turkey are also being constrained by the same forces that are constraining migrants. That would be, that would be a whole new step in the revolutionary project. Thanks, Nandita. I completely agree with that. I think that's a great note to, to wrap things up on. Uh, thanks everybody for, for listening and for your questions. Um, and thanks Simon again for, for, for hosting all of this. Um, yeah, and thank you, Nandita, for, for sharing all of that. I was going to dive in and thank you both so much for framing these very complex ideas, but in so succinctly and so powerfully. Uh, it's really been a great beginning to our No Borders post-nationalism week, which we'll actually will come back to post-nationalism. Um, but thank you so much, Thomas, uh, Nandita, thank you for sharing so much and so powerfully. Uh, and you're joined tomorrow in a panel with uh, Alex Sager from University of Portland. So I'm looking forward to that. People can also send in their questions. Uh, it's tomorrow, Friday, also at three o'clock. See you all then. Thank you so much. <laughs>